And uh, God made it really easy for me. He set it right on up so that we're going to talk about God's superpower okay. on Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, I didn't have to make anything up. That's really cool. Amen. You know, in the, in the spirit of football, we do have to get in touch with some football terms. For those of you who are not into football, Amen. and we have to redefine some terms for us here, you know. Um, you know, they have the term bench warmer in football. And, uh, and a bench warmer in church is somebody who does not participate in the worship. But we didn't have anybody like that here this morning, so that's really awesome. You know, in, the, in football, they have, a, they have backfield in motion. That's making a trip to the back during the service. That's a no-no. Amen, amen. An extra point is what you get when you tell the preacher that the sermon was written just for you. Amen, amen. But blocking is the person that keeps the preacher tied up complaining about the sermon afterwards. So. <laughs> you know, you know, then, then we have the flex defense. And the flex defense is the ability to allow anything and everything that's said to make zero impact on your heart during the sermon. <laughs> And then we have a fumble. Uh-oh. And a fumble is just a lousy sermon. Hopefully we don't have one of those today, okay? so. And everybody loves the blitz. And the blitz is the rush for lunch after the service. But we don't do that in this church. We, we, uh, we hang out and actually have fun together, you know? And then illegal motion. Illegal motion is leaving before the service is over. <laughs> Then you have an instant replay. And the instant replay is when you think that someone told the preacher about what happened with you because what he's talking about is exactly what happened in your life this week. <laughs> then you have the quarterback sneak. And the quarterback sneak is when you, try, when you come in late and you try and get to your seat without anyone knowing that you're late. <laughs> <laughs> and then for all you quarterbacks, they're staying in the pocket. Because a quarterback is in charge of the team. And staying in the pocket is what happens when you're in charge of your money and you don't give contribution. Oh. So. <laughs> Sudden death. Oh. <laughs> Sudden death. This is what happens to your attention span when the preacher goes into overtime. <laughs> <laughs> and then a touchdown is when the message is just right and hits your heart and changes you forever. Amen. 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 You know, today, uh, today is a day when your average ordinary guy gets flat fanatical in team spirit. And, uh, you know, people... All over the world, it's different. In this church, it's what it's like all the time. And if you look around the room, there's some different people in this room. There's, I think we have most of the races around the world represented right here in this room. And uh, that's definitely God's church. But you know, uh, people all over the world forget about their differences and join together to watch great commercials. <laughs> People go crazy painting half their bodies one color, half their bodies another. They paint John 3.16 on their face and they're not even called a cult when they do it. You know, how much more exciting is going to heaven? You know, if a football game can get people flat fanatical, how much more a church that changes lives for eternity? Yeah. You know... Uh, I'm excited about our lessons. I'm excited about our church and all the things that are happening. I mean, God is moving in such powerful ways here in Portland. Uh, you know, uh, we started out studying chapter 1. Yeah. And we learned about hope and the riches of God's grace just showering forgiveness on us. Yeah. And the incredible power that God affords our life. And, and then we moved on into chapter 2 where God calls us to develop spiritual character. Mm-hmm. And to develop a spiritual work ethic where we carry out the tasks of God. Uh, today we're going to talk about God's power. And the title is Superpowers. Yeah. You know, Today we're going to talk about the power of God and the vision that God has in this world. Ready to jump on in? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 1. Our first point today is it's bigger than you think. Okay. It's bigger than you think. Ephesians 3 verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. 
as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. You know, right here, we find that Paul had a revelation. He didn't have just any revelation. He had a revelation that was hidden to all generations before him. That's pretty cool. But he had no idea how big it really was. You know, have you ever gotten yourself into a situation thinking you're, it's going to be really easy only to come to find that it was a whole lot bigger than you thought? You're getting yourself into something you didn't even realize you were getting into? It's kind of like that when that good friend of yours calls and says, Hey, I'm moving. Can you come help? It's, it's, it's only going to take a couple of hours. And you show up to that house. And there isn't even really boxes. There's just stuff everywhere. And you go, this is not going to take a couple of hours. Maybe we can buy lunch. And a little extra in case we're here at dinner time still. Wow. You know, it's kind of like buying a home. Those of you who have bought a home know all about escrow now. But you had no idea what it was like before you started. You didn't know that you had to kill a forest and write a book to sign all the papers to buy a house. But you know, God's vision is so much bigger than you think. What He intended to do with, his, with this book right here, the Bible, what He intended to do in your life is so much bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. Even if you do have a glimpse of it, you have to realize it's still bigger than you think. You know... Uh, God does have a vision. Hold your place and go to Genesis chapter 1. In the early service, I was, I was giving this lesson to the Kingdom Kid teachers, and I was flipping and flipping forever, and I was like, why am I flipping so long to find the first page in the book? <laughs> it was right there, first page. Genesis chapter 1. You know, right from the very, very beginning, God has had a vision. The amazing thing is that he kept it hidden for so long. In chapter 1, in verse 28, the Bible says, God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve, right? God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. You know, right from the very beginning, God's vision for the very first two people that were on this planet was for them to fill the whole earth. Right. That's a lot of work. Right. <laughs> and to subdue the earth. That vision has never changed. That's right. From then until now. And yet, it kept hidden through all these generations. God took His people Israel, and their vision was that they were the only ones that were going to have salvation. Mm-hmm. For generation after generation, that's what people thought. Until Paul had his vision. Let's go back to Ephesians 3. You know, in, in right here, Paul talks about, he says, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace. I mean, has anybody here heard about the administration of God's grace? Yeah. Well, you know, he says, surely you've heard about that administration that was given to me, he says. Paul came to a revelation that he was to administer God's grace. See, God has an insurmountable amount of grace to give each and every person on the planet. But it doesn't just happen through osmosis. <laughs> he actually has a plan for how it's supposed to happen. And it involves people. Come on. And so Paul had finally had that revelation. And then he realized what God was asking him to do. That he was asking Paul to administer his grace... Not just to the Jews, a couple million people, no big problem, but to the whole earth. How about that? That's a huge, huge task. I mean, have you ever tried to coordinate a birthday party? (laughs) I mean, just trying to get everyone that you know to come to the party and actually show up is such a huge task. What if you were inviting the whole world? (laughs) Wow. Try and get everybody there to show up. What kind of power would that take? 
Facebook. There you go. There you go. The click heard round the world. But a very serious question. Do you have any idea how difficult it is to get people to accept God's grace? Come on. What kind of power does that take? I mean, think of your own heart. How much power does it take for you to accept God's grace? For you to realize that you have a calling too. Come on, bro. Come on now. That God actually has a trust that you're going to carry something out as well. You see, you have got to have a vision for what God has in store for your life if you're going to accept God's grace. Because the grace isn't just for you. You don't just snatch it up and that's it. We're all done. Just wait for heaven. He has a plan for your life. And something that's supposed to happen through that grace. See, the truth was hidden for so many generations. The Jews said, we're all done. Salvation is just for us. All the rest of you, sorry. Paul had a vision as well. Paul's vision was that he was supposed to go kill all the Christians. Paul knew the Scriptures better than most of the Christians did. And yet his vision of what he had read in his Scriptures was that he was supposed to go take all these guys out and kill them. He did not have a proper view of himself and what God had in store for him. And so this was an enormous revelation that God gave him. Let's go look at where he got that revelation. Keep your place. Go to Acts chapter 26. Come on, bro. Acts chapter 26. You know, what had happened is the first martyr had been killed for his faith, Stephen. Paul was traveling to go kill more Christians. I mean, can you imagine being in the car? Hey, let's go take take a drive to Seattle. We're just going to go kill a whole bunch of people. In righteousness. I'm in Jesus' name. Sweet, let's go. This is, this is what they were doing. Wow. Acts chapter 26. We're going to go to verse 9. You guys are lucky. You have the minister who turns the pages slower than anyone, so everyone can get there before me. It's awesome. Acts 26 and verse 9. Paul says, I too was convinced... That I ought to do all that was, a poss- that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. How about that? You know, there are people that actually think they're doing what's right, but they're actually opposing the truth about Jesus. Right. You know, it was that way then, and it's that way now. Yeah. Come on now. And here's a man who knew the Scriptures. I mean, sometimes we think, oh, well, this guy knows his Bible so well, he must be right. This guy knew the Scriptures better than anybody. And he, thought, he thought that the truth of it was to kill everybody. Wow. It says, and that is, he says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, because somebody told me it was okay, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Wow. He says, many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. Boy, it was tough to be a Christian back then, you know? And I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority of the commission and the chief priests. About noon, O king, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. Now that's pretty bright. Blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Holy cow, I would be just shaking in my boots. He says, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God 
so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul was chosen to be a servant. See, Paul just thought he was on any other trip. I'm just on my road to go kill some folks. He had no idea what he was getting himself into. He had no idea the magnitude of what that trip would mean for the rest of his life. You know, back in Ephesians 3, in verse 4, he says in reading this, then you will be able to understand the mystery as well. You know, reading, in reading this this morning, now Paul was writing this to the Ephesians, but surely he was writing it to you as well. Right. Yeah. In reading this passage this morning, you yourself are supposed to gain insight into the mystery of the gospel. No. That it's not just for you, but everyone else. Right. See, just as the charge of administering God's grace was given to Paul that day, that mystery wasn't for him and him alone. It was for you as well. Come on. Do you understand how big that is? Do you understand how big it is? I mean, let me ask you a question. Who do you trust in your life? Mm -hmm. Who do you trust with your life? Mm -hmm. See, God has said, I trust you. I trust you with the souls of everybody. (laughs) How about that? If not, you wouldn't be sitting in this room today. See, the degree to which you work to administer grace to people is the degree to which you understand the vision that God has for your life. See, you bebop around all week long at your job, doing what you do, but God has a bigger plan for your life than that. See, our first point is simply, it's bigger than you think, amen? Amen. Secondly, you know, that's a big truth to have dropped on your shoulders, right? Well, secondly, he goes on here in verse 6. Our second point is, can you handle that truth? Verse 6. It says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Members together with one, of one body. And shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, like Rich talked about so eloquently, I love that, Mathematical way to figure out all the great things that God has in plan. It says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made to the, known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms, according to His eternal purpose, which He accomplished in Christ. Jesus our Lord. How about that? In Him, and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. The mystery is really simple. Salvation's for everybody. But not everybody's just going to come and grab salvation except God's grace. And so there's something that must be done about that. See, the mystery is that the salvation, the gospel, is for everyone. The truth is that all believers are servants of that gospel. Chapter 4.10 says we're actually prisoners of the Lord. That's the view that we take of ourselves. That we are prisoners for God to do His work. You know, disciples in the room. You got any disciples in this room? Yeah? You, you know, can you handle the truth that your life is supposed to be guided and controlled by whatever it takes to save a lost world? Is, is that really how you're making the choices that you make in your life? Are they guided by whatever it takes to help others have the truth that you have? Come on. You see, is that not what guided Jesus every day? Yeah. Was it not just whatever it took to save a lost world, to seek and save what was lost? Yeah. I mean, did he, did he somewhere ha, ha, somehow have an easier life than you so he could just do it easier? 
No, he relied just on being a man and nothing else to get the job done. You see, verse 7 here in chapter 3 says that the power of God gives us grace. It takes a whole lot of power to overcome all the things that we've done in our lives. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know about you, but I did a lot of bad stuff before I was a Christian. I remember the days of being a professional drag car racer. And there were groupies in drag car racing just like there was in concerts. And uh, I remember doing all kinds of bad stuff. Lying, cheating, angry, bitter, unforgiving. It takes a lot of power to overcome all that and help a person that's done all of those things feel like they can save the world. Right. And, but the power gives us grace, and the grace is supposed to transform us into servants. And that changes everything, guys. It changes everything. See, a servant's attitude is different than the master's. A prisoner's attitude is different than the warden's. See, see, there's a reason why they chose these words in the Scriptures. To produce in us what would be produced in that of a servant or a prisoner, which is reverence and humility. And in verse 8, you come to find it, the humility it produced in Paul. It says, although I am, least, I am less than the least of all of God's people. Here's a man that knew all the Scriptures. He was driven. He was powerful. And yet he came to grips with the gravity of the sin that he had committed in his life. And the way he viewed himself is that I'm not even worthy. I'm the least of everybody. I, I just, I killed people. There's no one worse than me. Mm. And, the, and the funny thing is, that's the view that we're supposed to take. But all this jacked up stuff that happens in all of our lives, our past, our hurts... Mess that thinking up. See, because you're supposed to be able to think of yourself as being the least of all people while letting God's power work in you to make you the most powerful of people in the community. Come on. See, but we let our past and our hurt make us stop right in the middle with that we're not worthy of making an impact. Come on. But, you know, it takes humility in order to ha- correctly handle the truth. It takes humility to see that God has a vision for your life bigger than you have for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. You must view yourself the way God views you. Hold your place and go to Romans chapter 12. And Paul has another example of the way that we're supposed to think about ourselves. I believe this is how he got to the place where he said, I'm the least of all of God's people without being discouraged and down on himself. In chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, so this is what's supposed to produce in us, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Yep. See, we come in here, and uh, man, the singing was incredible this morning. Yeah. People are up, singing with all their heart, and that is, our, that is our worship to God. But on a day-to-day basis, you laying down your life so that others can know God is your spiritual act of worship as well. He said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, until you do this, you can't figure out what God's plan is for you. Until you flat get to work for God, laying your body down as a living sacrifice so others can be benefited, can you understand what what the plan of God is all about? He says, then you can test my will, and you can approve it and understand it. He says in verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, okay, do not think more highly than you ought. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. You know, how do you view yourself this morning? Some people think more highly of themselves than they ought. Others beat themselves up quite a bit. Um, It's very rare that you do find a man or a woman who takes a correct view of themselves, the way God intended. We usually think we're not worthy of anything and I'm not going to amount to much. I'm just going to be here. 
or we think we're all that. <laughs> and the funny thing is, he says right here that it's all about how much faith we have. And so, a person that views themselves as all that really has very little faith. Their focus is so much on themselves that they can't see what God sees. And they don't do what God wants them to do. You see, Paul had to get humbled for that to happen. That day on the road, that, 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 bright, that light that was brighter than the sun blinded him for three days. Yeah. And he had to go through a process of humbling in his life so that he could view himself correctly. His view of himself was, I'm to take out every Christian on this planet. And God had to humble him and give him a different vision for his life. He had to get a sober judgment of what God had planned for him. But see, the degree of humility that you have is directly proportional to your faith. It makes me think of my own life. You know, Tracy and I, we have our great City of Angels Church down in Los Angeles, right? It's really awesome. I mean, the last two weeks, they've averaged over 500 people each Sunday at church. And uh, for me... It was amazing because Tracy and I started that church. Come on, Ron. Come on. And I remember the very first service, and there wasn't 500 people there. Come on, bro. In fact, this front row right here is, was about the size of our church in Los Angeles when we started it. Right. And to see the impact that's being made all over the world by that church is incredible. Yeah. I mean, God has done all of that, and yet after that... I had a hard time believing that I was supposed to be in the ministry. I didn't. I just viewed myself. I mean, I, next month I'll have been a Christian for 18 years, Amen. and uh, it's been an amazing ride, you know. But for 16 years of that, even when we started the Los Angeles Church five years ago, we weren't full-time ministers. We were just like you, and we worked full-time jobs, and we worked full-time and did church full-time. And had our family full time, and did the cyber ministry full time, <laughs> and coached my kids' teams, and we, it, it was just—it was mind-boggling how God gave us so much power to do so many different things, wow. and not feel overwhelmed in the midst of it. Very often, <laughs> very often, and you know. But even after God working so powerfully and watching this church in Los Angeles grow up and build and become huge. and I mean, we had people driving three and a half hours. We had people coming from Mexico to Los Angeles every Sunday. We had people coming in from Palm Springs every Sunday. People coming from Bakersfield every Sunday to Los Angeles. And people coming from Santa Barbara. That's like people coming from past Seattle to come to church every Sunday. Come on. And I still, had, I still couldn't believe that God was working through us to do that. And that God had a plan for me to be a minister. Most people, if they get people to drive from another country to come into a service every Sunday, would believe, okay, well, I guess God's using me. But I still couldn't grasp it. Come on. What about you this morning? Come on. How's God, what's God's plan to use you to help somebody come to know Him? Can you see God working through you to help someone come to know God? Someone whose life is hurting, who smiles in everyone's face every day and goes home and cries at night because of how much they really hurt. Do you think God can give you the power to get them to be honest about their life? Yeah. Yeah. So that you can share His Word with them so that He can work in their life? Because it's not us, really. Right. It's us letting God work and not getting in the way. See, you have to have a sober view of yourself. And that doesn't mean think too highly, but it also, does, it also means don't think too lowly of yourself either. You know, it goes on in verse 10 here. Ephesians 3, verse 10. And this is where Paul really shows the church what the church is all about. You know, the only reason why Paul would show the church what it's all about is because they didn't get it. That's the only reason you write something. You, you don't tell people, do not fear, because they're not fearing. You tell them because they have fear. Yeah. You don't say, you need to be pure because people are being pure. You say it because they're not being pure. And right here, 
Paul tries to help them understand what the purpose of the church is. You know, we think, oh, okay, well, we, have a great, we need to have a great children's ministry, you know, we, we need to have great singing, and we need to have all these programs. But God has a vision for what the church is supposed to be right. doing. And it's right here in verse 10. Come on, it says, His intent now was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Right. You know, the manifold wisdom of God teaches us what we're able to do in any and every situation. You have a difficult situation, the manifold wisdom of God tells you what to do. You're feeling discouraged, the manifold wisdom of God tells you how to not be discouraged. You, You want to help somebody change their life, the manifold wisdom of God shows how to do it. The mission of the church is for that is to get that wisdom out into people's minds and hearts right. yeah. so that their lives can change radically. Wow. That's the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to evangelize the nations with the message of Jesus. Right. And a little tidbit, he wants it done by the time we die. <laughs> See, he doesn't want it. He, his plan isn't that it gets evangelized 50 years when you're dead and under the grave. It's so that you can see His glory while you're still alive. And here Paul really helps the Ephesians to understand your mission is to do what all superheroes do. You know, in the article I wrote about my my Saturday mornings, I would sit in front of that TV, and my mom's remember she's sitting back there nodding her head. I used to sit back there and watch Super Friends, and I wanted to run like Flash ran, and I wanted to hold my breath. I remember I used to get in the pool and I'd swim back and forth under the water, holding my breath as long as I could, you know, until I almost pass out, trying to be Aquaman. <laughs> you know, and then Wonder Twins activate, you know. <laughs> Where's my twin sister? <laughs> you know, and, but, then, but I really wanted to be Superman. Oh, yeah. I really wanted to be Superman. You know, I really wanted to fly. That is so cool. <laughs> and, and I dreamed about making a difference in this world. Do you remember doing that when you were a kid? Yeah. Who, I, mean, I mean, who didn't dream about making this world a better place? Yeah. But you know, the common thing about all of them in that show is they all had superpowers. And they use their superpowers to make the world a better place. Right. And God has the same task for you. It's pretty cool. You have a small little task. Save the world. How about it? I mean, can you handle that? Can you handle that truth that God has charged you with saving the planet? Literally. See, because if there is no church, there is no salvation. If... If we, if we get the church to be quiet and shut their mouths, there's no salvation for anyone. Go to First Peter chapter 2. Always holding your place there. We're always going to come back to Ephesians 3 today. That's in the New Testament, Richard. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. First Peter chapter 2 in verse 9. The Bible says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. You just thought that was the priest, right? (coughs) No. Every believer in Christ, in God's eyes, is royalty. Is that how you view yourself? As a follower of God today, do you view yourself as royalty? That God views you that way. It's cool. He says, A people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. See, He didn't just call you out of darkness so that you would be silent. He called you out of darkness so that you would come out screaming to the world. Come on. How Jesus changed your life. Yeah, right. How Jesus blinded you on a road one day and brought you into church, taught you how to live, gave you the manifold wisdom of God, and now nothing can stop you. Come on, now. See, that's what the gospel of Christ is all about. And that's why you're here this morning. That's right. Can you handle that truth? <laughs> can you handle that you're not supposed to stop until the job's done? Wow. You know, today we're going to see three people get baptized into Christ. <laughs> I mean, that is just, that's incredible. He's like, yes! I mean, it's better than painting your face at the Super Bowl. It's better than going out screaming and losing your voice. But how horrible if we just took a break because of it. Oh, we're done. 
I mean, Kristen and Deer are it. I mean, they're flat awesome, but they're not the last people on the planet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Go to Ephesians 4. <coughs> I mean, it was really awesome studying with Justin. But Justin isn't the last student at PSU. Come on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> In Ephesians 4, verse 10, he says... He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all of the heavens. In order to what? Oh, fill up your city. No. He says to fill the whole universe. See, your goal is to not shut your mouth. To keep blabbering about Jesus everywhere you go and everything that you do. Right. That is why God made you. That is the purpose of the church. Is that we can't stop talking about God to anyone. That's right. Yeah. That's what was so exciting about Ola getting baptized, because he gets to get up on TV and talk about it, for real. Okay. It means something when he says, Jesus, I want to thank God yeah. for what's happened in my life. Right. It's not just some rapper up there <laughs> saying, praise God, thank you, Jesus, for my millions. I mean, that young man is grateful. I talked to him last night. That young man is grateful right. for what God has done in his life. He's grateful that God gave him this mother. She's his hero. Yeah. But Jesus is also his hero yeah. as well. Come on. But he's not the last person on the planet. He's not the only football player out there. Okay. There's a whole lot more of them that need to change their lives. That didn't have mothers that were this awesome. Come on. That need a spiritual mother in their life. Right. Yeah. That need a spiritual father in their life. That need a brother to be there during their hard times. And that is why God made you. Come on. See, God's grace is supposed to be administered to everyone. Right. Yeah. Come on now. Does it stop with you? Mm. Because you have challenges? Does it stop with you because you can't view yourself the way God views you? Well, you see, when you understand that God's grace is to be administered to everyone, and that is your mission and your purpose and you're all about it, that's when you can approach God with confidence. Right. That's when you have freedom from all your issues because you understand God's bigger than any issue that you could ever have. Come on. See, the truth is that Jesus didn't just die for you, but He died so that you would tell everyone when you came to life. Mm. Can you handle it? Mm. Thirdly, we heard a lot of truth, but what are you going to do with the truth? Verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says, For this very reason, I kneel before the Father from whom His whole family in heaven and in earth derives His name. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide, how long, and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. You know, uh, you have an incredible truth yeah. that you may have even just learned today. But what are you going to do with it, is the question. Come on. Verse 14, you see here that it was bigger than Paul ever thought. He, what the heck did I get myself into? All these people singing, crazy, hugging me. <laughs> Woo! The first service I went to, a guy hugged me, and I threw him up against the wall and, by his throat and told him I was going to kill him if he touched me again. <laughs> God has worked a miracle in my life. <laughs> I mean, when you have Chris Van Dam and me hugging each other, that is God working, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he's powerful. And he works. But what are you going to do with all that? Are you just going to hold it in? I mean, you're going to like explode if you hold it in, you know what I mean? I'll tell you what Paul did with it. He prayed. See, it was so big. He realized that it was so big, he knew that it was beyond his own ability. And that drove him right to his knees. He prayed that every person in the church would understand the revelation that he had had and that they would have it themselves. He prayed that they would understand how big the mission is, 
That they, were, that they would understand the truth that God had trusted them with people's souls, with their very lives. And that He knew, without a shadow of a doubt, His view of them is that they would carry it to the rest of the world. He prayed that it would humble them so that they would pray to get the strength of God as well. That it would humble them enough to drive them to their knees in prayer so that they would ask for God to give them the right power. Right here he prays that they would be strengthened in their inner being. Not that they'd get a better job. Not that their boss would stop giving them a hard time. Not that their spouse would stop annoying them and put the cat back on the toothpaste. But that they would be... He prayed that you you and me would be strengthened inside so that no matter what problem was happening, we would have the power to overcome it and would not be shifted by anything that would hit our lives. Awesome, Ron. He prayed that you would go to Him for His power so that you could do more than you could ever possibly imagine you could do. How'd you, what did you pray about this morning? <laughs> oh, when you got up, what did you pray about? Come on. Yeah, some guilty faces, amen. amen. That's why we have preaching. You know? You know, it, it makes me think about some of our very, very best friends. You know, Richard and Connie Kawili. And uh, James and Jennifer Haynes. Um, you know, for these couples, leadership of God's people was bigger than they thought. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Rich, pull, I mean, his hair's short, not because he gets a haircut, because he's always pulling it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm trying to get, get these guys all unified, man. Everybody's going their own direction all over the place. What the heck do I do about all this? Connie's over here going, God did not choose me, Rob. <laughs> it's not, it's, you, got it, you got it wrong. He didn't really choose me. Yeah, he did. And, <laughs> <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was difficult for them to come to grips that God had chosen them. Mm-hmm. They, think, they thought Ron and Tracy chose them. But it was difficult for them to understand that God chose them to be instruments to be used. But each one of them has made their own individual decision of what they're going to do with the truth. And that decision has led them to call you late at night, to be there when you call late at night, to pray for you, to serve you, to lay their lives down for each of you that are in it. If you're in their group, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They all work tirelessly. They work just as hard as I do as the minister to serve God's people. Laying down their lives for their groups, for the lost, and we lay down our lives for each other. I mean, it's, it's awesome to have friends where they know everything about me. I know everything about them. They know what's in my bank account. I know what's in theirs. They know about every fight Tracy and I have. <laughs> and, and you know what? There's a, there's a lot fewer fights since they started knowing about it. <laughs> and Connie's happily married now. It's... <laughs> That is God. Me and Chris hugging and Richard and Connie happily married. How about that? But you know, just like our core leadership, that's our core leadership team. I mean, we've got Chris and Alba who we pulled into the team there a little bit, but they're, they're brand new in the team. But you know, these, these, these couples are amazing, guys. You need to imitate the way they've allowed God to work in their life. They pray for each of you every day. Yeah. And they pray for the lost. And that's why we're seeing three baptisms today. Because they got a vision of what God wanted to do with their life. Right. What could He do if every one of us in this room got that vision? Right. What are you going to do with the truth? Okay. You know, let me ask you a question. Do you have a love that you show to other people, right? That surpasses knowledge? Mm. Do people think it's weird how you love? <laughs> Because it's beyond their understanding. See, that's what it's talking about here. He says, I pray, in verse middle of verse 17, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power 
together with all the saints, to grasp. See, Paul was praying that you would get it this morning. Come on. That you would grasp the love of God, which doesn't think about how I'm being treated. It thinks about how am I treating others? What am I doing for others? Not what good intentions do I have. But what do I actually do for others around me? To know this love that surpasses knowledge. Just blows everyone's mind. How about it? Is that the kind of love you show for people? If not, we can help you how. (laughs) We got a lot to do. (laughs) There's a lot of people to get to. Disciples, are you rooted and established in love for one another? See, are you loving people when they don't deserve to be loved? Or do you just stop? Wow. Come on. Are, are, you, are you going the extra miles? <laughs> the extra miles for people so that they will know how much forgiveness God has in store for them no matter what's happened to them, no matter what they've done. See, we're administrators of God's grace. Let's blow people's mind with our love. Amen? We'll close out with one final point. You do have the power to save this world. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever in the church said, How powerful is your God? How powerful is your God? I mean, let me ask you, what can you imagine your God doing to make an impact in this city? In this state? In this country? In this world? Um, My God's big. Let me tell you, my God is big. My God's going to change this world and I'm going to watch it happen. Right. I'm going, to put, I'm going to be a part of it happening. Yeah. But I'm going to just have a blast watching it all happen yeah. as well. Let me tell you, watching that church from 12 people to now be 500 people was a pretty cool thing to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Week after week after week, people coming in. Marriage is torn apart. Don't forgive their parents. Not respectful to their parents. Come back together the way God intended. It, it's the, it, there's no... It, bag movies, man. You can't write this stuff, okay? It's way better than any movie than you could ever watch. But you know, your life and what you're doing day to day right now shows how powerful you really think God is. We can say God's powerful, we can sing loud, but the way you're living shows how powerful you think God is. There is so much power at your disposal, right at your fingertips. There's so much power that you can't even measure it. I kind of like to think of it this way. Do you know why everyone likes room service so much? (laughs) Everyone likes room service because you pick up the phone and you call up and they bring you anything you ask them to bring you, whether you can afford it or not. (laughs) Do you know that that's, that's life as a disciple of Jesus? Constant room service from God. Wow. Jesus is the waiter that brings it in. Wow. You get spiritual room service. All you got to do is call him up. <laughs> call him up, you know? Right. Tell him what you want. He's the main operator. He, pick, he doesn't have a receptionist, okay? He picks up the phone himself and answers your prayer to be able to do whatever you want to do in his name. So all you've got to do is want to change the world in Jesus' name and call Him up. And it will happen through you. See, you can't measure His power, but you can read His Word and let it change your heart. It should change your heart. It should change the way you think. It should change the way you pray. And it should change what you say. It should change who you walk with and how you walk with them. See, you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside you if you're a believer this morning. Yeah. If you're not, run scared and come find one of us. Come on. That's right. Because there's so much for your life that's waiting to happen. Wow. Come on. If life is beating you down, you don't have that power. And you need it this morning. Right. Yeah. 
See, everyone talks about making this world a better place. This morning, I hope you realize you actually have the ability to make that happen. Everybody else is a bunch of hot air. But you have the truth. You can actually make your community a better place. You can make your school a better place. You can make this city, this state. You can make the world a better place. You know, little old Portland here. Come on, Portland. We have over 25,000 people that look at our website every month. Wow. The sermons have been downloaded in almost every country of the world. On every continent. Just this little church is making a global impact. Come on now. You want to know why? Because some of us actually believe we can. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. It's all about what you think. Come on, See, once you realize that, Jesus, that this whole Jesus thing is a whole lot bigger than you think, <laughs> once you decide that you can handle the truth, Come on. and then you decide what you are going to do with it since you got it, <laughs> once you realize you have an immeasurable unimaginable power right at your fingertips. Then you will realize that you got superpowers. You know, you want to you want to change your mom's heart? You got the power to do it. Call him up. You want your kid to be faithful? Call him up. You want to make enough money to be able to share and not struggle? Call him up. I was a guy with high school diploma, made $130,000 a year with no degrees, no nothing. Come on now. That was the power of God, because I'm a derelict in my nature. But God made everybody believe I wasn't a derelict, because I obeyed His Word. You see, you can have superpowers. You can be that superhero you dreamed of being when you were a kid. Having the same visions that the Lord has. Making the manifold wisdom of God known to everyone, so that they can live the way God intended for them to live. And to fill the whole earth with a love that no one can really understand. And change everything in every way. Have an awesome afternoon. Have a great Super Bowl. Love you.